Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the good third morning. session of the COVID-19 Leadership Challenge. Good morning. It's the, our team now is facing the impact of COVID-19 on major tourist spots in the country. We have at the moment more than 70 participants logged in in this Zoom meeting. <clears throat> Thank you for your time. This session is organized by the United States Agency for International Development, or USAID, through its Strengthening Urban Resilience for Growth with Equity, or SEARCH project. This is done in partnership with Publicus Asia and the Association of Political Consultants in Asia, or APSA. I'm Dina Lihauko, the component crew lead of the SEARCH project, and I will be your host for today. We are glad to have with us distinguished speakers, guests, and longtime partners from our eight CDI cities and other LGUs. We also have with us from the national government agencies, private and business sectors, and also the academe. In the interest of time, I will no longer name each one of you. Let me cite a few guidelines for us to have an orderly session. We will share the presentations after the event through the search coordinators. You may also view the recorded uh, sessions in the Facebook page of Publicus Asia. For the participants, please turn off your camera and mute your microphone. Please use the chat box to ask questions and state to whom they are addressed to while the discussion is ongoing. We'll raise them for you or call you during the open forum. Please wait to be acknowledged by the moderator before asking your question. Kindly state your name and organization and once acknowledged, participants may turn on their camera and microphone. Please ensure that you are viewing the screen in side-by-side -side mode to see both the speaker and the presentation. Very briefly, let me walk you through the program. After the opening preliminaries, we will have the key messages of the organizers of this event. This will be followed by the sharing of experiences of the four cities in the Philippines and guests from the United States of America. We will then proceed with the open forum where our speakers can have an interactive discussion and on their points. <coughs> you may also ask questions to our speakers during the open forum. We will close with the synthesis of the discussion. At this point, I would like to call on Mr. Sergio Andal Jr., our Chief of Party, Surge Project, to officially welcome you and our guest. Sir Serge? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we are here to talk about responses to the COVID crisis at the local level. And uh, we will hear the challenges faced by local leaders under this new complex and uncertain terrain. The topic today is tourism in the time of COVID and how local governments respond to this challenging environment. This session is organized by the USAID through the SURGE project. SURGE, as uh, we explained before, is the Strengthening Urban Resilience for Growth with Equity. It seeks to promote the economic growth in partner cities in a way that is resilient, inclusive, and equitable. We work in the cities of Batangas, Ligaspi, Puerto Princesa, Tagbilaran, Iluilo, Cagayan de Oro, Zamboanga, General Santos, and Marawi. Surge is implemented by the International City County Management Association, an association of city managers uh, based in Washington, D.C. Uh, Publicus Asia is also our partner here. Publicus is the first and only SEC-registered political consulting and lobby firm in the Philippines. Our moderator later on, Professor Malutikiya, is the founder of Publicus. She is currently on leave to take on the job of president of Universidad de Manila. Uh, Malu also used to host the CNN program agenda. The other uh, partner is the Association of Political Consultants in Asia, or APCA. It's a network of individuals who seek to promote the professional conduct of political consulting and campaign management in the Philippines. And Asia, APCA is headed by Dr. Joey Leviste, who many of you know is the chairman of AGNP, is one of the leading names in business in the Philippines and a recognized expert in political consulting and campaign management. So once more, 
I thank our partners for making this session a reality. Muli magandang umaga po sa inyo lahat. Salamat po. Thank you, Sir Serge. May I now call on Mr. Patrick Messner, the Deputy Mission Director of USAID Philippines, to give the agency's message of support. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. Um, there's a lot of people on the call, so I can't recognize everyone, but um, I will recognize a few. Mayors Rosal, Byron, Yap, Moreno, Duterte. Uh, if, if you have all joined, Dr. Tran, Mr. Joseph, Ms. Takiya, Dr. Laviste, friends and partners, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. And again, thanks for having me uh, at this meeting this morning. Um, I've met several of you, especially in, in, in the cities um, across the Philippines uh, in my two years here. Uh, and I hope to be able to meet others of you very soon. Um, actually, I hope to be able to travel outside of Manila and visit your lovely cities sometime very soon for some rest and relaxation, if not business. For those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Patrick Westner and I am the Deputy Mission Director for USAID Philippines. USAID is the lead US government agency on international development and humanitarian response. So as we can see, summertime is just ending here in the Philippines. It's a time usually when thousands of people flock to the lovely beaches and the historic sites of the Philippines to enjoy their vacation, their summer vacation with their family and friends. But in our current environment, instead we are asked to stay at home to support the measures of our local and national governments in combating the scourge of COVID-19. We all know that we all have a role and responsibility to play in combating COVID-19. With this COVID-19 outbreak, the whole world has closed its borders to restrict travel and contain the virus. Among the sectors that have been hardest hit by COVID-19 is the tourism industry, including those tourism-related uh, services and products that are provided by small, medium, and large enterprises. According to the UN World Tourism Organization, 100% of all worldwide destinations have imposed travel bans of some sort in response to the pandemic, 100%. So this has caused a 22% decrease in international tourist arrivals during the first quarter of 2020. But that is just the first quarter. I mean, I think around the world, for the most part, the second quarter of 2020 is gonna show an even sharper drop. And this has cost uh, almost $1.2 trillion. Here in the Philippines, uh, tourism comprises about 13% of GDP and about 13% of total employment across the country. So with the pandemic or with the start and, and the full spread of the pandemic here in the Philippines, upwards of 5.4 million people working in the tourism sector either have lost their jobs or stand to lose their jobs as the lockdown restrictions continue. The resilience of the tourism sector though in the Philippines has, has been proven through the decades, but this pandemic is truly unprecedented. And we are facing a tremendous impact uh, that it's not only brought to the healthcare system and on, on the healthcare of Filipinos, but also on all livelihoods. So let me take the opportunity to stress that the U.S. government is committed to support the Philippine government and the Philippine people in the fight against COVID-19. We stand in solidarity with our tourism stakeholders, workers, and local governments during these challenging times. Since March 2020, the U.S. government through USAID, the U.S. Department of Defense, and the U.S. State Department has provided about a billion pesos, a billion pesos worth of funding and assistance to support the response to COVID-19 in the Philippines. Moreover, many of USAID's ongoing development projects worth more than five billion pesos annually have been mobilized across the various sectors, not just in the health sector, but in the environment sector, in the economic development, uh, democratic governance, and the education sectors to combat the disease. USAID through these programs has extended technical assistance to help workers and entrepreneurs retool their businesses under the new normal. We supported 
tourism related businesses and local tourism councils to formulate business continuity plans and to come up with strategies that will help navigate through a quarantine and more importantly, the post lockdown business landscape. USAID has also assisted, assisted local governments prepare citywide and sector specific economic and recovery plans. These include support to strengthen the city's incident command system and policy development to support new normal operations. These are just some of the activities that USAID and the US government is implementing for the fight against COVID-19 in the Philippines. Beyond ensuring that tourism operations resume once travel restrictions are lifted and lockdowns are complete, there's still a lot of work to be done. We also need to take into account consumer and business confidence, economic impact, and government measures to support tourism in the long run. We hope that through this learning session this morning, participants will gain more insights on how to develop tourism and marketing strategies with their respective quarantine conditions. I would like to express my gratitude to our guest mayors and other experts for joining us here today uh, uh, to share your best practices and your experiences so we can all learn from them. I'm, I, I do really look forward to coming down to some of your cities uh, in the very near future, one, conduct business, but also just for some rest and recuperation and to meet up with all of you. Uh, just a note that I will have to leave at 10.30 this morning, so you will see me duck out of the meeting. But uh, thanks again for having me provide some opening remarks, and good luck to everyone during the forum today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick, and thank you for USAID's continued support. We will now move on to the highlight of the session, the presentation of our speakers. We have with us today Honorable Mayors, of the three most visited tourism sites in the country. With us today is Mayor Noel Rosal from Legazpi City. Mayor Noel served three consecutive terms as the local chief executive of Legazpi City and was re-elected with no opponent in 2013. Under his leadership, Legazpi received notable awards such as Gawat Kalasad, Seal of Good Housekeeping, and Second Most Livable Cities in the Country, among others. Mayor Lucilo Bayron of Puerto Princesa City will be represented by Councillor Matthew Mendoza. Mr. Mendoza chairs the Committee on Tourism, Committee on Public Works and Infrastructure, Committee on, uh, on Local and International Relations. He heads the Palawan Tourism Council and the Association of Tourism Accommodation of Puerto Princesa City. Mayor John Gisnel Yap of Tagbilaran City Baba Yap is on his third term as the mayor of Tagbilaran City. During his second term, Tagbilaran was awarded most business friendly by the Philippine Chamber of Commerce and Industry for the city's e-payment system, which enables easier and more inclusive financial transactions. I'm sorry, Ms. Mayor uh, Isko Moreno will not be able to join us today. He has an urgent meeting to attend to. So we will, joining our mayors today, are our guests from the United States of America, Rob Joseph, a former assistant city manager and director of the Office of Business and Tourism for Montrose, Colorado. He's a certified destination management executive, a past destinations international board member, and recognized by his Colorado ICMA peers as assistant city manager of the year. Scott Mitnick, City Manager, City of El Segundo, California, United States. Mr. Scott Mitnick has over three decades of public service experience with six California local governments, with 21 years at, at the executive level. He currently serves as El Segundo City Manager. From January 2017 to March 2019, he served as Country Administrator for Sutter Country County in Northern California. I will now give the floor to our moderator, Ms. Maria Lourdes M. Piquilla, President of the Universidad de Manila. Ms. Malu. Thank you, Diana. Uh, good morning to everyone. Maganda umaga po sa inyong lahat. Uh, simulan na po natin ang discussion today. Yes, uh, good morning everyone uh, to our 
distinguished guests who were earlier uh, properly introduced. Good morning. I will be presenting uh, in behalf of our city mayor, Mayor Lucilo Bayron, um, the what have we encountered during this uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic and what uh, are we going to do about it? Uh, we prepared some slides. If uh, um, we can now proceed to slide number two. Yes. Yes. Um, to tourism is the major economic driver of the city. It is the home of the UNESCO World Heritage Site, the Puerto Princesa Underground River, and the best island destination on the Bay Island. Uh, in 2019, receipts generated more than 5.45 billion worth of revenues, with uh, 1.2 million tourist arrivals and more than 2,100 MICEs events. However, these figures dropped by 80% this first quarter. Next slide. Even as early as January 2020, the tourism sector already felt the impact of the pandemic, with slow tourism arrivals and with accommodations that have been fully filled up uh, compared to 2019. All the more this downturn became apparent when the city imposes, imposed the ECQ quarantine last March 15, 2020. We had to close our borders, close tourism sites and attractions, and cancel all major events in an effort to contain the disease. Only 4% of the tourism accommodations remained open to cater to stranded tourists, long-staying guests, and to serve as quarantine facilities. Our CBSD has been affected. Next. Next slide. To date, uh, Puerto Princesa has 28 active cases, six confirmed cases, 22 suspected cases who are in quarantine facilities for a total of almost 465 LSI or ROIR in other quarantine facilities. Next is our challenges. First, the necessity to strengthen the fragile city health system capacity. We do not, we do not have enough medical facilities. We would like to improve our capacity to effectively handle and contain COVID-19, as well as contain an eventual surge in case. At the start of the lockdown, we barely had 10 isolation rooms and six ventilators. Our second, displacement of tourist workers. They lost uh, loss of income and livelihood for micro, small, and medium tourist enterprises. As reported by our city tourism department, an estimate of 1.5 billion from tourist income were lost during the month of March and May of this year. And 15,000 tourism and tourist related formal and informal workers and associations have been displaced in the Puerto, in the Puerto Princesa Underground River. Workers agreed to reduce their salaries and limit reporting from work just to ensure that around 2,000 workers are still employed to financially support themselves. What our, what's our response? Next, next slide, please. Our response and strategies and actions. We recognize that this is a long-term battle that requires immediate and long-term actions. So what have we done so far? With the primary objective to mitigate or reduce transmission of and protect of and protect the Puerto Princesa city residents. First, we mobilized and the incident command center, organized barangay emergency response team, fast track procurement of health equipment and supplies such as PPEs, body bags, uh, supportive medicines, equipments and supplies, laboratory for confirmatory testings, increased isolation rooms to 66, in the three hospitals catering to the city as well as the province. Mobilize two teams of contact tracers, transform hotel accommodations as temporary quarantine facilities for health, front health workers, frontliners, as well as for those with uh, mild symptoms of ROF and LSIs. 
Next slide, please. Next slide, please. The city passed policies and memorandums in compliance with the IATF, such as approve appropriation for the purchase of medicine supplies and sanitation and disinfection kits amounting to 75 million, canceled all commercial carriers in and out of Puerto Princesa, as well as sea and air transportation, mounted sweeper flights to accommodate stranded tourists and special flights to transport ROF and LSIs. Operationalized the tourism communication hotline to accommodate stranded tourists and LSIs, ROFs. Continued strict border controls, check, checkpoints and curfew with, tem with temperature checks as well as guidelines for work from home and stay at home, 14-day quarantine and curfew policies. Next, please. Addressing the income, livelihood, and worker displacement. In support of the tourism industry, the city facilitated the following. The following. First is a partnership with BPO CITEL to temporarily hire displaced tourism workers. B, coordination with the City Tourism Council to facilitate requirements and release of DOLE, TUPAD, and CAMP SAP, as well as a small business corporation for tourist SMEs, approve a resolution requesting for the inclusion of CBSTs in the SB Corporation COVID-19 P3 Enterprise Rehabilitation Financing, allowing transport, motorized bankas, and tourist vans to operate as fishing boats and public utility vehicles. Next slide. The city implemented a wide caring program. First is the free fuel and 500 incentives for transport operators. Free commuter ride or the Libre Sakai program. Rise subsidies and relief assistance. Cash assistance of 1,500 from the city as well as in the barangays. Issuance of quarantine pass and daily curfew rounds. Free disinfection of public and private transportations, disinfection of boot, disinfection boots and hand washing stations, community kitchens, urban gathering seed, urban gardening seedlings distributions, mobile markets, consolidating and buying farmer products. And uh, for E, business sectors adapted and innovated their operation by starting the online the online orders, drive throughs and food delivery models. Production of face masks and shields, including MSME's business development for ROF, ROF and PREs. F, strengthening agriculture and fisheries, such as organizing the Food Security Council, piloting community-based clustering and marketing services, on agriculture and fisheries, seaweeds and farming tourism, granting tax holidays until December 2020, as well as working for debt relief to tourism MSMEs, facilitate bank loans and mortgages without penalties until July 31 of this year, especially for tourism transport. Use the time to build and retool the skills of our tourism human resource through trainings, aligning, reopening protocols with IATF, DOT, and DOH circulars, and other manage amidst the pandemic throughout online, through online session and uh, webinars. Next, please. Our results, okay. Over time, we improved our level of capacity to accommodate arriving ROFs and LSIs for testing, quarantine treatment, and tracing. Increased our operational quarantine facilities and uh, funded the 14-day quarantine of all returning LSIs and ROFs. Increased number of isolation rooms of the three hospitals 
operational testing laboratories. We allotted 75 million as initial fund for COVID-19. We received a recognition from various embassies and DOTs in facil facilitating almost 1,000 stranded foreign tourists with food transport and accommodation. Ongoing assistance to 500 ROFs and 3,000 LSIs. We hired, hired displaced workers in BPO, formulated the city tourism reopening and response plan with the assistance of surge and DOT. The plan will implement uh, business continuity actions to manage and mitigate the impact of COVID-19 and prepare the industry for the new normal. The plan focuses on sustaining business operations and welfare of workers, appropriate infrastructure, livelihood, and adequate social services, promotions, marketing, and product development. Readiness of tourism establishment in reopening attraction this July 2020 for local tourists, such as the Crocodile Farm, Astoria Palawan, Kinabuch Restaurant, Kakawian Forest Park, with caution and subject business continuity and health and safety protocols. Putting in place new operating procedures, health and safety protocols, physical distancing, sanitation, and use of protective gears for the front lines. Implementation of touchless, contactless tran transactions in tourism establishments and services before its reopening. Okay. For lessons, um, we also need to prioritize our health services, our health systems. We adapt diversity and innovate. Communications and dialogues and engagement with stakeholders. Technology and automation, as earlier mentioned. Facilitate and mobilize resources to support the tourism industry. While there are challenges economically, there are also opportunities to improve on our services. Our facilities, our marketing and retool to our marketing and retool our human resources. We are given time to gather our resources to plan a better and grander tourism experience in the future. Okay. I would like to close by sharing and by thanking USAID for their support to the local government, to our city, to our city tourism. And uh, in behalf of our mayor, Mayor Byron, uh, I would like to thank uh, USAID again for giving us the chance to present. Uh, actually, it's, there's a longer presentation, but I don't think I, I have the, enough time for it. So thank you again. Thank you so much, Councillor Mendoza. Um, may we have Mayor uh, Noel Rosal of Legaspi? Mayor? Everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, sir. Yeah, yeah good morning. So I would like first thank each and everyone for this uh, meeting giving Legaspi opportunity to discuss and share also our experiences uh, relative to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the impact on our tourism industry. And uh, as you all know, almost not only the Philippines, almost every, everyone in the world really suffers a lot of losses. But the best thing that we have to share now is to to combat and minimize the impact uh, of this to our people and of course uh, to the industry uh, specifically so i would just like to run down my presentation uh, of some issues relative to legacy city as you all know 
Legaspi is uh, one of those uh, top five convention destinations in Luzon right now with an average of 85 to 100 uh, convention, regional, even national scope, and sometimes international events. So this year alone, we have a lot of activities supposedly. Foremost of all is the uh, International River Summit supposedly this August, but uh, because of the pandemic, uh, for sure it was uh, already canceled. No? And uh, of course, uh, when you talk of convention, it is part of the MICE, meetings, incentives, conferences, and events. No? So uh, the arrivals, of course, we will lose about 13,000 plus delegates and about uh, 70 million. Uh, projected uh, cash inflows to the city and uh, this is also one thing that we, we want to strengthen the hotels and upper hotels which because of the delay in the construction they have to postpone the uh, the inauguration or the completion next slide please so just a rundown of some of the event that was supposedly uh, scheduled here in Legaspi. No? So this international event, the Philippine Paragliding World Champion and Pre-Accuracy uh, World Cup. So of course the ISQA, which attract about 8,000 uh, participants for private, uh, for uh, state universities and colleges throughout the country. No? And uh, of course the Toastmaster International District 75 Conference. Next slide. Uh, so we have also small conventions, but uh, we have also big uh, in scope like the Philippine Society Mining Convention, the Exhibit the uh, Leconex, the Philippine Association of Court Social Workers. Uh, you just run down. Next slide, please. This the River Sabit, and by September supposedly the PAP Annual Convention. So next slide. So, uh, regarding the uh, impact on our city revenues, regarding the capitalization, supposedly before COVID could have been uh, really uh, the, the, the shining moment of the city from 40 million no, to more than 313. This is attributed mainly to the, to the investments on hotels, restaurants, and infrastructure in the city. The gross receipt expected supposedly amounts to 4 billion. Uh, no, no, the increase from January to March, I mean, was uh, uh, an income about 4 billion, an increase of about 3 billion compared to January to March of 2019. Dito talaga medyo maganda sana yung naharap ng Legaspi. We're expecting really uh, to graduate now on the 1 billion mark when, it's time, when it comes to income in total for the papers of the city. Next slide. For tourist arrival, uh, compared to, uh, uh, if you will see the, the uh, 2019, March to April, we have a total of, of uh, about uh, 675 million. But because of the pandemic, we were not able to realize this this year. Next year, next, next slide please. For, to, for the tourism industry, uh, these are about the total. If you will notice, uh, we were locked down for about more than two months. And uh, in that day, in that period alone, almost 90% of the hotels, restaurants, uh, has to uh, uh, stop operation and of course, the manpower or the uh, the workers has to stay in the home. So with this, these are the total people displaced during the lockdown in the Gaspi from March to the last week of May. Next slide. Yes, as all local governments, especially those uh, whose trust is tourism, like Cebu, 
Boracay and even others. So of course, uh, these are the forecasts for our tourism. Uh, decrease, of course, in tourist arrival, both foreign and domestic. Low occupancy rate, of course, temporary or full closure. Displacement of workers in tourism and uh, lower demand for tourism related services. As you all know, ATB is really the in thing in Albay, in Legazpi, attracting uh, an er a yearly one million tourists for our people. Huh? So these are the forecasts now that we have really to anticipate, but uh, we're doing our best as we return to work uh, to do more on the infrastructure or construction of our tourism-related activities. These are the uh, things that now uh, being given preferential attention. So these are the program services and policies for tourism. So for the moment, because of lack of uh, arrivals, we have to develop emerging and potential tourism sites in the central business district, like the, the Sawangan Park. We are improving our uh, uh, various parks in the city using our local and uh, grants from the national. Um, right now it's ongoing and it's about, some of them are already 70%. Uh, uh, to be completed and some to be started. Upgrade the capacity for mice, meaning we have to prepare not only for quantity but also the capacity to uh, to uh, uh, entertain and to uh, to be able to achieve the level of excellence in service to very to maintain our mice standing in the country as one of the top when it comes to mice uh, activities per year. Improve accessibility and linkages to existing and other attractions. These are the things that we have coping up with and uh, maybe the people uh, will really be very, very surprised that despite the, like, the lockdown, the construction of various roads, uh, opening of new, new bridges connecting to tourism attraction like the Botanding in, uh, in Donsol, the many beaches in other provinces that will serve as additional uh, attraction to our visitors. Ito yung mga talagang tinututukan natin ngayon. In Ligaspi alone, we have about 1.6 billion under construction. Promote health and safety guidelines for the promotion of sustainable tourism under the new normal. So, as you all know, Legaspi is one of those rated when it comes to disaster risk reduction management. So, this is not this is no difference. That's why uh, even we are the center. We we, we were we were hit by uh, by cases about 30 of that, but we were able to minimize or stop the local transmission. To this date, we have only about two positive cases out of the 30, you know, which are asymptomatic and uh, to, 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 to be discharged the soonest. So again, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for Legaspi, as our uh, dream right now, that by 2020, to make Legaspi the top five convention destination in Luzon. Uh, we've achieved this even two years Ago. But for me, Mayor Rashad, I think Mayor Res we we just lost Mayor Rashad. Uh, Mayor Rashad. Okay. Uh, let's just uh, push on with our uh, with our schedule, and we'll have Mayor Rosal to. Uh, wrap up his presentation when he connects with us again. Uh, may we have uh, Mayor John Yap of Tagbilaran? Mayor Yap, are you here? Yes, ma'am. Can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor Noel Rosal, Mayor Lucilo Byron, represented by uh, Councillor Mendoza, Mr. Rob Joseph, Mr. Scott Mitnick, Mr. Patrick Westner, Mr. John Avila. 
Mr. Ser Serge Andal Jr. to all of us here. Good morning. May I envision our city? May I present our city? Tagbilaran envisions to be a highly urbanized, resilient, and livable city. We have 15 barangays with a population of over 140,000. We have four economic growth areas spread out across the city. In the past two years, we have maintained our status as the most competitive component city in the Visayas region. And we have received the seal of good local governance or SGLG for the first time since 2010. Tagbilaran City takes pride in being a cultural heritage city. Our authentic Boholano cuisine and food attracts tourists and guests as well as our festivals and cultural shows and performances. We are also a center for meetings, events, and conventions. We thank the USAID Surge Project for their support <laughs> for STEM initiatives. Our natural beauty rests in our scenic coastal views and landscapes matched with beautiful sunsets. We have very well laid out our tourism development plan as a cultural heritage city with creative industries with the technical assistance and support of the USAID Surge Project. Again, I would like to thank USAID for the partnership. COVID-19 has negatively impacted our tourism. Loss of jobs, employment to close to over 3,000 tourism-related personnel, loss of income to about 600 registered tourism-related establishments, which pours annually about 1 billion to the local economy of Tagbilaran City, or about 80 million a month. These tourism-related establishments pay an aggregate annual ta tax revenue to the city about 8 million pesos. Our challenges point to the need of <laughs> first meeting the daily subs subsistence of displaced workers who have lost their jobs. Second, about 72 restaurants are now converting to food deliveries and no dine-ins as of the moment. Third, now that the city is under GCQ, the challenge on how to reopen under the new normal. Fourth, with these new normal challenges, there is a need to retool and retrain tourism industry players to adapt to feel safe. To respond to the needs of ensuring aggressive prevention against the spread of the coronavirus, the city did massive disinfection of public places, buildings, and business establishments to give assurance that business is safe. To provide for the needs of displaced workers and other jobless residents, we distributed four waves of relief goods to all households in Tagbilaran spread in two months. To make food supplies accessible and available to communities, at the same time encourage MSMEs to operate, we set up barangay-based mobile markets and mobile markets, creating a semblance that business continues. Even if we are in the midst of a life-threatening pandemic, we do not forget the health concerns of our children, elderly, and pregnant women. So we conducted balay-to-balay checkup to ensure the wellness and health of our citizenry as we transition to the new normal. We are optimistic that Tagbilaran will recover. We will relaunch our cultural heritage program, enhance food and cuisine with the reopening of restaurants, optimize social media for cost-effective online tourism promos, work with TESDA and academic institutions for more virtual retrainings and capacity buildings activities for tourism players. Our lessons learned. First, quick crisis response is important. Tagbilaran has a quick response team. Second, effective communication is necessary, especially in crisis situation. Keeping all informed through social media, websites, and radio programs. Private sector partnership is also important with Bohol Chamber of Commerce and BAR. Fourth, coordination at all levels from national and provincial and local government units is essential. And fifth, a positive mindset for change management. Adaptive processes, innovation to transition to the new normal should be developed by the tourism sector. And as we continue to pursue our vision to be a leading sustainable 
creative city with a vibrant heritage tourism and cultural only if we work as one and we recover as one that we can well adapt to the new normal in the tourism sector and continue to pursue a vision for Tagbilaran tourism. And as we say it in Tagbilaran City, hashtag stand together Tagbilaran towards hashtag Asenso Pamor. Thank you very much and good day to all. Thank you very much, Mayor Yap. Uh, may we call now uh, Mr. Rob Joseph for your presentation? Mr. Joseph? Mr. Joseph? I, sorry, Hello. okay, I unmute myself. Thank you. Myself. Ready to go. So um, thank you very much. If you could please um, go to the slides, I'll get right to it um, because I know we're tight on time. It So, uh, thank you. So, Megan um, Maga, everyone, I'm uh, very thankful and excited to join you this morning. And um, over the next few minutes, uh, I'll talk broadly about uh, strategies that municipalities and um, destination marketing uh, um, organizations. So destination marketing organizations, I'll refer to as city tourism councils, because I think that's how you refer to them. So um, we'll talk about how, how they are adopting um, response and recovery actions. I won't talk too much about mitigation because you guys are doing an amazing job with mitigation. So I don't want to sort of um, go back over that. So essentially then my presentation uh, is, is around two main points. One is uh, what to, uh, some, some activities that are optimal for the present and then things that we should consider as we build for the uh, future. The, um, the name of the game right now is Empathic Inspiration Marketing. Empathic Inspiration Marketing. So your brand needs to show how it's useful and how it's helpful and how it's able to empathize with the situation generally. And, we, and we're doing that uh, in, uh, in two ways. One is to build external goodwill, and the other is to build internal goodwill. So um, lean into your brand voice and use the platforms that you have as a force for public good as you determine how to, um, how to bring solutions to, to, the, um, to the marketplace. Engage your audience. Now your audience, of course, uh, are your local stakeholders, and your visitors and guests. And so we wanna be able, we, we wanna be talking to our people all the time. Uh, let your audience know which phase you're in, uh, what they can expect, tell them what you're doing, and mostly tell them what's going on. And um, you know, right now, for example, so, so I should say that much of my talk tonight is coming from uh, uh, information that Destinations International is passing to uh, DMOs or city tourism, uh, excuse me, city tourism councils. And um, Destinations International is, uh, is the tourism agencies as ICMA is the cities. Uh, so, so that's sort of the, um, the comparison. So there's essentially three phases that we had talked about, but they all seem to have blended together now. There's the adjust phase where you have travelers that are sheltering in place trying to work out the logistics of life caused by the magnitude uh, of this crisis. Um, the question there, if you're, if you're in that mode still, because see, the thing is, there's no clear cut, um, there's no clear cut phase now. There's a lot of gray. Um, the second is the peak phase where people are beginning to adjust to that new life without a definitive light at the end of the tunnel. And then of course, there's that recovery phase that we've been talking about, and that's all part of that new normal. So in these three phases, um, I'm gonna share with you three questions that uh, you should consider with your tourism councils. So in the adjust phase, um, consider please, what can your brand do right now to alleviate confusion um, and even add a little joy. So, so, so what can you do to, to like um, let people know what's going on and, 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 and put things into an inspirational 
inspirational message. If you're in the peak phase, then the question here might be, how does your brand help people physically, emotionally, or mentally? Because remember, in the peak phase, people are adjusting to that new life. There's no definitive end. And arguably, there's still no definitive end. We are, uh, you know, uh, different, different countries, different areas within countries, all are really in different situations and different uh, phases of the, of the virus. So, so, so there's no clear-cut black and white condition. If you're in the recovery phase and you're thinking about, okay, we're going to start opening up now, as some, as some cities uh, and destinations are doing, then the, que the question here is, how do you provide clarity for the unsureness? And mostly, how do you collectively create a sigh of relief? And how do you impress upon your visitors and your stakeholders about the notion of safety? So, so, so these are some things to consider when you're in those phases. Now, and then the other thing is um, to provide incentives now for the recovery phase. So if you're not in the recovery phase, great time to do it. If you started with the recovery phase, it's still a good time to do it. But the bottom line is, as you talk to people, um, uh, provide them with gamified challenges, um, do a lot of work on, on, uh, on social. There's a lot of fantastic marketing that's going on right now in social, and it's garnering a lot of attention, a lot of goodwill, a lot of excitement, and it's, and it's preparing people who are sitting at home as they start to think about planning uh, because right now they're dreaming in the five stages of the tourism cycle. They're in stage one, they're caught and they're dreaming, but they're going to start planning soon. And so you want to be in front of that. So, um, and then internally, what you want to do is you want to support and help your employees. You want to uh, uh, continue to build your partnerships with your businesses and your commu uh, uh, community constituents. With employees particularly, one thing to consider, and I've heard some of you are doing this, which is a really fantastic. Um, one thing is uh, if there are employees that are furloughed, um, you know, stay in touch with them, continue to uh, see how they're doing because this will affect your brand positively and it will continue to build that goodwill between the employees and you and from the outside, um, you know, outside people looking in. Um, next slide, please. And so now, what we'll talk about a little bit real quick is building for the future. A couple of points here. You know, we wanted to, um, I, I know initially you were uh, interested in talking about alternatives to traditional tourism activities. And one thing that's, um, that's, uh, uh, that I know about is this idea of community marketing organization. A community marketing organization is more than a city tourism council. It's more than a destination marketing organization. It essentially coordinates your city and tourism efforts. Uh, it creates connections for economic development success by way of uh, overseeing standards and ensuring consistency with the destination and the community brand. So it gives a fantastic consistent message to people uh, and, it, and, it, and it positions your community as really knowing what, what you're doing in a very professional uh, way. Um, but it's professional, but it's very together with your partners. So, and then uh, because of this idea of deliberate messaging, so you create the right connections with the right audiences, with the right partners, and then you deliver economic development success in many forms because the information, the, um, the CMO, the community marketing organization is managing centrally to ensure that, that consistent and cohesive brand centric approach to everything your community does. Um, and then we uh, should consider developing programs to engage partner businesses to expand their reach. Really, really good to, you know, come up with some uh, creative co-op programs and see what you can do online with them, especially with social. Uh, most importantly, during this time, uh, don't stay on the sidelines. Be very mindful of the quality and the veracity, the truthfulness, the accuracy of the content that you're running. People will evaluate your brand um, and they will support you based on how you performed and how you behaved throughout this crisis. So be patient, get creative, get practical, help people through this difficult time. Do the right thing. 
That's what people will remember when all of this is over. And just to leave you with some uh, quick stats, the American Association of Advertising Agencies just completed this survey recently. It's still pretty hot. 56% of consumers are happy to hear how brands are helping communities in response to the pandemic. 43% find it reassuring to hear from brands they know. But listen to this, 85% want to hear from you during this time. 85% of people want to hear from brands. They want to know what's going on because people may not be planning their trips right now, but they're likely dreaming of travel and they're seeking inspiration. Thank you very, very much. It's been my pleasure to be here this evening with you. Thank you very much, Mr. Joseph. Uh, may we now have um, Mr. Scott Mitnick. Sir, are you here? I'm here. Can you hear me? Great, yes. Okay. Well, good evening. Uh, I don't have a, a slide or PowerPoint, but I do have an outline and I will um, stick to the questions and um, go over the experience of El Segundo here in um, Southern California. So for those of you who don't know where El Segundo is, if you've ever flown in or out of Los Angeles, you've, you've stared right at our city and probably didn't know where the city immediately south of uh, Los Angeles International Airport. Uh, so um, we are definitely impacted by changes in tourism or changes in uh, travel. And uh, we're a small city geographically. We're approximately five and a half square miles. So we sit south of LAX. We're right on the beach. Uh, you can see the little background there. That's our beach. And uh, we're, um, we're a unique city in that while we're small geographically with a small residential population of about 17,000 people, our residents are crammed into uh, approximately one square mile. And then uh, two square miles of our city is a, a re oil refinery for Chevron. And then the rest of the other two square miles are dedicated to commerce. And so we have a lot of companies uh, headquartered here or have a strong presence. You recognize many of the names and we have sports franchises, for example, that are headquartered here, the Los Angeles Lakers basketball team, the Los Angeles Kings hockey team. And, uh, and, and the list goes on. We have, uh, I don't know, 75,000 or so private sector jobs. So we have a robust economy. Uh, and one that is uh, dependent uh, to some extent on tourism, though not necessarily as a destination, but more for the, the business traveler as well as um, the, the leisure traveler who's coming in and out of, of Los Angeles. We do have uh, approximately 15 hotels and they're being hit hard. So some of our challenges here in, in El Segundo, and they're reflective of the, the, um, the Los Angeles area, is our, our revenues in the municipality have been hit hard. I could read off statistics, but the other uh, mayors did a good job illustrating how their communities have been impacted. Same here, our, our revenues are down quite um, substantially and we've had to deal with that, especially revenues associated with the hotels. Our single largest revenue source in the general fund is our transient occupancy tax. The, the tax rate is 10%. And uh, normally we would receive $15 million a year in, and, and that's down um, quite a bit. In fact, I lost my numbers here. Um, we're estimated to lose about $6 million this year. So that's about $500,000 um, a month. And for a city with a general fund budget in the $80 million range, that, that's material. So to compensate yes. for the revenues, we've had to do a fair amount of um, on the expenditure side. And we've had, to, we've had to freeze a number of positions. We haven't yet gone down the path of layoffs, but that, that could happen down the road. We've had to delay a number of capital improvement projects. We have some large projects that are tied to um, sales tax revenues statewide and um, or countywide, and those are, are being uh, potentially delayed. Uh, we've had impacts on our senior population um, as well. So we have both one-time impacts and, and recurring impacts. Our private sector has been impacted. I mentioned the um, hotels. A number of layoffs have taken place in the private sector. Thousands of jobs in our city have, have been lost. We're hopeful that they will come back uh, when COVID-19 is, is behind us. The sports franchises uh, around us have been impacted. Many of you may be aware of the new stadium being built in a nearby Inglewood, the SoFi Football Stadium. That's uh, American football. 
uh, soon, soon to be home to the LA Rams and the LA Chargers, that is it's having impact on that stadium. It will open soon. And here in El Segundo, we, we have a number of hotels that would serve that, uh, the, the folks that go to the sporting events there. Again, that stadium is within a few miles of our city. So um, that, that's an impact. I mentioned the impact to LAX there, the number of flights have, have been hit significantly and jobs associated with those flights in our city have been uh, impacted. There's also a number of, uh, of private sector developments that have been put on hold and that impacts our, our community. So in addition to dealing with COVID-19, the pandemic, here in um, the United States in general, but California in particular, we're dealing with the recurring uh, impacts of the civil unrest uh, associated with uh, what would happen, um, the, the, the tragic death in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. So we've had a number of protests uh, here. So we have two state of emergencies, one dealing with the pandemic, one dealing with the civil unrest. So having to simultaneously manage two emergencies has proven to be um, quite challenging for us. When we look at our strategies to go forward, uh, we did trim our, our budgets and we're looking at ways to deliver services uh, more efficiently, more effectively. And I'll tell you, there's an upside um, to all this. When you're, um, when you're dealing with a crisis, it provides unique opportunities to do things differently that you normally wouldn't be able to do because the process to get there would be burdensome. Uh, it would take a long time. And, and here in, in our community, our city council has been really good to react to uh, directing us to come up with ways to to uh, do things faster and, and, and better. So for example, we're looking at um, a reorganization within uh, our, our organization. We're looking at what we can do better uh, with um, our county, Los Angeles County, adjacent cities. Um, and we're looking at with the, the reopening of the economy that has started, how can we um, serve our business community better and more efficiently uh, in terms of the permitting, and the process you have to go through to uh, get things done uh, for the, um, the property owner. Uh, for example, here in our, our downtown, a long, long time desire of the local restaurants is to have uh, outdoor street dining, possibly use use of the city's sidewalks and, and streets. And so normally we were resistant to that, but in this situation, we've now listened to the local businesses and we have actually closed off at, at least one street so far and try to turn it into more of a walking street. And right now it's dinner time here and if I were to go down the road, uh, you'll see dozens and dozens of people eating um, outdoors uh, on the city street. So we streamlined the process to get those approvals. We worked with the business community to um, block off the, the streets. Another, um, um, advantage we were able to, to, to um, take or the situation we were able to take a, a advantage of is when we reopened our public golf course we were able to adjust our, our rates um, uh, fairly quickly to be more um, competitive with the marketplace where we would have had to um, take a longer time to do that so there's a lot of lessons to be learned I will tell you I know we have very short periods of time but we will see a different, um, we talk, heard the phrase new normal, but, but when we come out of this and when as business comes back online, uh, the way businesses and stores operate, they'll be different. We'll see more social distancing, more attention to personal hygiene, and uh, the personal hygiene will be rolled into the economy in terms of how goods are, um, are sold and delivered. Uh, some industries will allow for more telecommuting and in an urbanized place like Los Angeles County where people drive long distances, we'll see more um, opportunities for telecommuting and there'll be more um, um, synergies and more approaches to how, how businesses operate and how they deliver services. But remember, we're still very much um, social animals and we like to interact uh, uh, with each other so you won't see where, in my opinion, where everybody works from home. I think you're going to see more of um, a combined effort there. And you may see in the office space environment a, a need for um, a more physical space in the offices to allow for um, social distancing. And also on the upside, looking for the cure for COVID-19, a number of our biomedical firms are working hard to, to come up with a um, a, a, a way to solve the virus, a vaccine, and so on. So that'll create some opportunities. Uh, I like to read 
one letter or an email that I received from a, one of our local hotels, which uh, talked about how their occupancy went from 90 to 100 percent for the longest period of time, dropping way down to like 10 uh, percent. And then now they're recovered. They're in the 30 to 40 percent during the week and 50 to 60 percent on the weekends. And they're telling us now that they're starting to see um, more leisure travelers coming through. Uh, and uh, so we're, we're seeing a, um, a slow um, return to a normalcy in that area. So that, that's a real quick summary of what we're facing here in our community. I do want to end by sharing with um, uh, my colleagues, whether you're elected or appointed, um, many of us have been through a lot of challenges and disasters. And I think about the three decades I've been in this business here in California, I've, I've watched us go through a number of crises. And after each one, we think it's sort of the end of the world as we know it, but we've always managed to come back and to come back a little stronger, a little more resilient. And if you look at the landscape in California, whether we faced, um, gosh, early in my career, we were dealing with savings and loan crisis. We had earthquakes, the Loma Prieta earthquake in Northern California. We had the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, we had housing bubbles. We had the Rodney King riots of 1992, the Northridge earthquake in 1994, flooding in Northern California in the late 90s, the Y2K crisis, the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s, the Great Recession 2008-10, um, major wildfires over the past decade, the Orville Dam failure incident, evacuation of multiple counties in 2018. And so now here we have the COVID-19 pandemic and the George Floyd um, killing incident and the civil unrest. But with each instance, if you step back and you look at it objectively, we figured out how to deal with that. And we'll, we'll come through this pandemic, we'll come through the civil unrest, we will make changes to how we do deal with policing and law enforcement and we'll make changes in terms of our personal hygiene and how we approach pandemics. And with each disaster in California, and we do a great job in terms of emergency management services, we're, we live for this stuff. We live for disasters, earthquakes, fires, floods. Um, we will do a lot of self-reflecting what worked well, what didn't work well. We know we need more um, hospital space. Uh, and we do work, one of the upsides is we work very good uh, uh, collaboratively and regionally uh, we, the different cities and counties, special districts pull together. So uh, those are my comments. I'll leave you with a quote from Winston Churchill when he was prime minister uh, during World War II, and it seemed like the end of the world there. He pointed out, don't waste a good crisis. So we have a terrific crisis here. We're learning a lot, and we'll come through stronger and better. Those are my comments. Um, sorry if I was a little long-winded. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Mitnick. Uh, is uh, Mayor Rosal back? Mayor Rosal, uh, you were uh, you were cut off the air. Would you want to uh, make your closing remarks in your presentation, Mayor Rosal? If Mayor Rosal is not here, uh, let's start the the question. Uh, uh, Q&A part. Uh, let me throw the first question uh, to all our uh, guests here. Um, it would seem that COVID-19 allowed our... Good morning. Good Mayor Rosal? Yes, Mayor Rosal? I'm listening. Uh, would yes, you want to I'm finish listening. your... You were cut off the air. Would you want to finish your presentation or uh, that's okay and we'll go to yes, the yes, no, no, no. no, 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 they, they, I, I'm just to share again before the, I just uh, been cut the closing message. Yes. Yeah. So Please. as I've said, uh, yeah. So as I've said, uh, with all of these preparations, now, when we were now elevated or downgraded to MGCQ by the IATF National, so just to inform everybody that business is uh, almost back here in Legaspi, observing the minimum healthy standard like the 50% occupancy 
uh, of all the restaurants, festo bar, with due care of the proper hygiene, of course. And number two, uh, we are also allowed the opening of hotels, subject to the rules and regulation of the tourism and PTI. And uh, of course, uh, it opened now uh, a lot of activities which uh, observe the social distancing to cope up now with these uh, hard times. At least we can start all over again. And uh, for the past uh, 20 days, uh, the data or the records of our positive cases continues to flatten now because of the things that we have initiated. The system that we have in place, uh, especially for contact tracing, number two, to uh, those arriving locally stranded individuals, returning overseas Filipino workers, those upward. So we have devised a system so that we can ensure the safety of our people, especially in the business community. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor Rosal. Uh, my first question to our panel is, uh, with COVID-19, it allowed our, our uh, natural ecosystem to breathe. We now see pristine beaches, uh, green trees, uh, the birds are back, the air quality uh, is very good. Uh, I guess that's across all political boundaries. Uh, to what extent do you see ecotourism being a driver to the recovery plans that uh, you are planning to craft? Um, yeah. May we hear so from me? Yes, sir. Mayor Rosal? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. You know, you know, ma'am, compared to cosmopolitan cities like Metro Manila and Cebu, Ligaspi uh, always maintain. We are not that, uh, we do not have that such problem on, on uh, pollution. But the only thing that uh, was given advantage on this uh, pandemic is we were able to really now analyze what are the things that we have that we have to treasure, meaning uh, the ATB. We have the, uh, the Laba front, which majority of major tourist destination does not have. Now to preserve it more and how to, to, uh, to make it more environmentally uh, 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 care be given by our people, not only in the government, but in the people. And number two, we were able to realize that uh, because of almost three months that the people were uh, locked down in their houses, we were able to realize that our beaches, our uh, hills in the southern portion of the city can be really an added attraction because of the cleanliness, because of the, uh, the people's participation that uh, it should be maintained that way. So we will use this now as a weapon later on that it needs really the shared responsibility of the people living in Legaspi and of course the stakeholders. Thank you, Mayor Rosal. Mayor Yap? Same question, Mayor Yap. Thank you, ma'am. In the province of Bohol, we have always been uh, lucky enough that we have our beautiful beaches, we have the Chocolate Hills, we have the Lobok River, and uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic, as you mentioned earlier, that we were able to breathe. But then again, pollution has never been a problem of ours. We have always been, uh, we have always been proactive about it. So under the leadership of Governor Art Yap, we were uh, promoting tourism. In fact, we were expecting all our tourism before the pandemic of COVID-19. But now, uh, because of the beautiful spots that we have, we are confident that tourism will be back as soon as the flights will be coming in. So we have no problem here in the province of Bohol and in Tagbilaran City. Uh, Councillor Mendoza, please. Yes, hello. Yes, sir. Yes. 
Yes, uh, the, the question is essentially COVID-19 allowed our uh, natural ecosystem to breathe. Uh, to what extent would ecotourism be part of your uh, recovery plan uh, uh, in Puerto Princesa? Yes, uh, ever since naman, uh, uh, ecotourism was a part of our tourist, our tourist uh, plans and we, uh, we've been practicing ecotourism uh, ever since, even before I became a counselor. Um, so it, that's it. It's a part, and it will always be a part of our tourism, uh, our tourism plan, and our how we conduct our tourism. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Uh, Messrs. Uh, Joseph and Mitnick. Would you want to contribute uh, some of your ideas in terms of uh, uh, including ecotourism in the recovery plan? Uh, what are your experiences in your own jurisdiction? Todd, do you want to go or shall I go first or? Please go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you. So, so um, regarding ecotourism, I'll talk for Colorado. Uh, you know, Colorado is known as, um, as an outdoor adventure state and um, Montrose, which is in southwestern Colorado, is renowned for its uh, literally world-class uh, recreational opportunities. So when it comes to ecotourism, um, you know, Ecotourism has always played a role in Colorado, but now it's going to play an even larger role. And so, and so we're very, very optimistic about that. One, you know, one, one major comment I'll make, though, is that uh, uh, most analysts now are beginning to um, uh, raise their confidence in the fact that leisure travel will return quicker and faster than business travel. And so um, there's... Uh, there's a big pent-up demand um, and a healthy um, uh, requirement, if you will, for people to get out. So any community um, that you know, any community that has mostly outdoor recreation or, or or just natural beauty to sell will be in a great, great place. But again, it goes back to making sure that you're staying in touch and building strong relationships uh, online with your stakeholders and with your visitors. Mr. Mitnick? Sure, thank you. What a great question. I, um, I would tell you one of the things we've learned in California in general, Southern California, the LA area in particular, and I, I was born and raised here, and um, the environment and the economy are inter intertwined, and to think that they're separate and you can have one without the other would be very short-sighted. So the, the photo behind me is of our beach, and you'll see it's a clear skies and, and, a, and a nice day, and the quality of the air quality here in Southern California is so much better today than it was when, when I was growing up. We have fewer um, smog, smoggy days uh, than we did years ago. We, as uh, hopefully are aware that in California, we've led the way in terms of uh, requiring cleaner gasoline for the cars with unleaded gasoline and that type of thing. So whenever you're in a really bad situation, remember I mentioned uh, don't waste a good crisis. So. Yes, we've had problems here in Southern California in terms of traffic congestion, air pollution, urbanization, water quality, and so on. That water behind me, that used to be where um, LA Hyperion, at some say up until recently, I guess it was the world's largest wastewater treatment plant. I don't know if it still is in the world, but definitely in the United States, treating water for 4 million plus people, and then the sewage used to just be dumped into that body of water. Now it's not, that's not done anymore. So we were able to use technology to come up with a, a better, safer, and more environmentally sensitive way to deal with the challenges of urbanization. We've heard from the other speakers in, in the Philippines, they take pride in the urbanization that's taking place. And I imagine they also take pride in the environmental technology that will go along with that. Our friends in China are facing incredible amounts of pollution and congestion and so on. And I know they're working really hard to also lead the way and coming up with a better balance between the environment and the economy. So uh, we can easily be very cynical and negative and say, hey, it's just, it's terrible. But, you know, we're human beings, we wanna be here for the long haul, so we'll figure out a way to make it all work in balance. So lots of lessons from, from my neck of the woods in, in being successful, and I'd be happy to talk offline about areas where we haven't been so good at it. But um, mother is the greatest, necessity is the greatest mother of invention, right? Or something, something like that. 
So we'll, we'll figure it out, but great examples here in our, in our part of the world to learn from. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Uh, there's a question from uh, the audience. Let me read it from Patrick Ragoniel. Uh, taking the optimistic viewpoint, once COVID-19 has been effectively controlled, whenever that will be, what plans do you have for an expected sudden surge of tourists, not only locally but internationally? Are there safety nets to avoid the potential environmental effects of such event as businesses try to recoup their loss during the pandemic? How do you ensure compliance to regulatory policies of the local government? So those, th th that's a three question, uh, the three questions you raised. Uh, uh, with the sudden surge of tourists, not only locally but internationally, how do you plan to control this? Uh, what are the safety nets? Uh, to avoid potential environmental effects, such as businesses trying to recoup their loss during the pandemic. I guess this is more of the, the pricing protocols uh, and strategies that you will uh, roll out. And how do you ensure compliance to regulatory policies? Who would want to take the first crack? Uh, Mayor Yap, would you want to take the first crack on these questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. Here, here. Please. Here in the province of Bohol and in Tagbilaran City, ever si uh, uh, even before COVID-19, even before the pandemic, we were also planning about our septage, our uh, wastewater treatment also with the help of USAID and Surge. So after this pandemic, we will be able to continue our planned project and then we will be able to uh, finalize everything and then hopefully it will also, uh, the municipal other municipalities, other municipalities will follow as well and uh, we won't have any problems with the uh, influx of tourists that will be coming in especially Bohol has been uh, receiving the influx of tourists here ever since from the start so uh, we won't have any problems with the surge of tourists that will be coming back in okay uh, Councillor Mendoza please Yes, uh, same here in Puerto Princesa. Um, we have been expecting a lot of uh, tourists. Uh, we started from 100,000 tourists. We are now at 1.2 million tourists per year. Uh, we are ready for this situation. We have uh, different agencies who monitors the movements and uh, movements and uh, environmental concerns, uh, such as uh, we have the Palawan Council for Sust Sustainable Development. We have our Bantay Gubat, our Bantay Dagat, who monitors um, tourism and other environmental activities here. So I can say that uh, we are, uh, we just have to continue doing what we have been doing for the past uh, decade. We have to strengthen our, our ties with the private sectors for close monitorings of the movements of our uh, tourists, incoming tourists. Thank you, Councillor Mendoza. Mayor Rosal? Yes, uh, Madam, if you will compare Legaspi with the two gentlemen from uh, Bohol and uh, Puerto Francesa, they are really uh, very known for tourists uh, uh, because of their beaches and resorts. Legaspi is more on uh, the, as the center of trading, the center of uh, the regional government, and of course, our ecotourism of the city. Since uh, flights is still under control, but still we are expecting arrivals, especially for uh, the authorized persons outside of residence because of the regional governments, uh, almost 99% are, are here in Legazpi. So we're expecting visitors because of uh, meetings that were left out the past three months. So we're expecting that uh, visits as usual especially for hotels, small hotels and big hotels. At least this will perk up the economy in the next uh, six months of the city. So we have to prepare um, now more on the, uh, the uh, minimum health standard, uh, especially uh, uh, in those hotels that we will accept now visitors 
to ensure the safety. So for the meantime, uh, we have put all the necessary uh, preventive measure like uh, the executive order for hotels, for restaurants to put markings so that uh, it will instill discipline not only for the local residents but also to those visitors. And I think after uh, one month, almost one month of preparation, Lake Gatsby now is ready again. As a matter of fact, the flights uh, coming from Manila already resume. We have uh, almost everyday flights coming from Manila because of the uh, many activities of, of government agencies in Bicol. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Rizal. Uh uh, would uh, Mr. Joseph uh, care to comment on the question? Thank you. I just have uh, a couple of real quick things to say. With regards to the surge, um, the surge in tourism, I would say that um, the industry expects uh, air travel to come back relatively slowly. Um, and, and, and there is a conversation right now whether it will be led by uh, the business segment or the leisure travel segment but the business segment has taken a big hit of course and with uh, what we're doing now with zoom and and these kind of technologies it could be a little bit slower to get uh, to get particularly the mice uh, segment back up to where it was and then um uh so when we talk about capacity with surge we have to remember that airlines have uh, airlines have cut back their fleets to almost 1990 levels. So, um, so there's going to be time and, 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 and resources needed to get those back. I don't think, this is me personally talking, I don't think we're going to see an amazingly large surge uh, very quickly because I think people are going to want to see if there's going to be a second, you know, a second round um, or, or if this has gone away and, and they're going to want to evaluate the safety aspect of it. And of course, that's going to take time. With regards to uh, a safety net for pricing, um, I just want to comment that it's going to be interesting right now to see if uh, hotel and airline brands will maintain their price discipline um, or if they will try to uh, adjust rates to spur demand. So, so we don't know. That's an unknown. So th thank you for the opportunity to comment on that. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Uh, sure. Um, make sure I address the question right. And um, I'll, I'll tell you this, so, so, some good comments. I, I would echo the, the, the comments. We don't anticipate a, a surge as if we're, um, to use an economic phrase, the V curve where the market went down and all of a sudden it's popping back up. Uh, we believe it'll be more, more gradual. In fact, where I sit looking out my window, uh, I'm just about a mile and a half from the south runway at LAX. So I, I'm used to seeing flights take off um, you know, every minute or so. And, and now it can go five, 10 minutes and I don't see a plane. And what the planes I do see tend to be more cargo than uh, passengers. So um, we look forward to seeing more planes down the road. But I'll tell you one of the interesting observations here is this pandemic is forcing us in the United States to think more about the importance of addressing social service issues, uh, health issues. Do we have sufficient um, bed space in our hotels? Why haven't we been prepared for pandemics? Um, those happen in Asia and other places. But we, you know, it, we're, it illustrates how interconnected we are and how global the world economy uh, truly is. Something can happen in, in North Dakota and in two or three months, it's impacting uh, Manila, uh, the Philippines. So, it's forcing us to think more about that. It's also forcing us to think about topics we don't like to talk about or deal with, homelessness in particular. It's been a big issue at uh, Los Angeles International Airport. Now they've taken some at the airport, uh, some very um, um, strong steps to limit the homeless population uh, at, at the um, airport and to be sensitive about hygiene issues and so, and so on. So. Um, I'm not saying one's good or bad, but it's forcing us to, to think about these issues. It's forcing us to think about social interaction and the, the role of public health. I'm not sure how it's structured in the Philippines, but here in California, public health is, is typically dealt with at the county level and the cities deal with the traditional um, uh, local government services, uh, public safety, land use, public works, that type of thing. So now we're seeing the interconnectivity of, of all, all of this and 
I think going forward, uh, you're going we will see uh, more attention to to these issues that we haven't really wanted to have to acknowledge and deal with uh, before. Now it's all much more interconnected. So I just wanted to point that out. Thank you. Uh, to our to our two foreign guests. Uh, let me ask you a straight off question. Would you be willing to travel in the next three months? And, and, and how would you restore traveler confidence? Uh, for example, would you be willing to visit the Manila, uh, the Philippines? Uh, would this uh, be something in your uh, you know, decision uh, process uh, for the next until probably December? Uh, where are you there? Mr. Mitnick, you're smiling. I'll go second. A good city manager. <laughs> a good city manager waits for the others to speak first. Okay, uh, Mr. Joseph. <laughs> That's lovely. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, you know, um, I love to travel, um, uh, and 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 but 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 you know, but I also want to be safe. So, um, mm -hmm. as far as me personally traveling. I'm not, uh, I'm not making any plans right now, but I am keeping a very open mind and I'm just sort of observing and um, reading a lot and just seeing what's going on. I am, uh, I am concerned. Um, I am concerned when there's, when there's a challenge between um, well-being and economy, it does, it does, um, uh, it does um, make me think twice because at least in America, I know that we have a tendency to favor the economy first, and um, and so and so. If that's the case, and people get out before this thing is over, before it's controlled, my fear is that the second round will be worse than the first round. Um, not necessarily in terms of uh, uh, illnesses and deaths, but in terms of the psychology. And so and so, human beings are funny animals, and so. You know, uh, we're bit, you know bit once and then bit twice and then and then it'll take that much longer to get out. So so I think I'm just sort of in a holding pattern. I'm very optimistic about how we come out of this. That I will tell you without hesitation. I just don't know when I personally will be traveling again. Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Well, that's a good question. So I hope um, we're not going to be quoted and referred to. <laughs> We, we may not be the, uh, the, the, the best guinea pigs. But I'll tell you, it's funny, I, I was having this discussion with my family recently. I have uh, two, two twin boys, and they're, um, they're 19, and one goes to university in Wisconsin, one goes to university in Seattle. And so they've been forced to stay at home, and they're getting ready to go back, and, and one will be flying back to Seattle in a couple of weeks. And so we have this discussion about, is it safe? And... You know, it depends on your, your personal situation. What's your age? How healthy are you? Do you have any health issues? Are you at risk? What type of measures will you take? Where are you going? Where are you staying? I, I will tell you, for those of you in the Philippines, um, I would welcome you to come to the United States, come to Los Angeles, stay in one of our hotels here in El Segundo because our hotels are pristine. They're probably the safest place to stay overnight in our entire city because they're so thoroughly um, disinfected and, and clean and um, and you might have um, a very nice room and be the only room on the floor. So um, I don't know how you would be exposed to anything. No, uh, uh, personally, again, for me to answer your question, if I, it depends what I'm traveling for and, and where I'm going. But would I personally be worried, afraid? Um, probably not, because I would take the necessary precautions to be safe. I would probably be going somewhere that I know who I'm staying with. Or if I'm going to a hotel, I would scope it out and make sure it's, it's safe. So. The best thing here is not to overreact, to be cautious, um, but not to be so laissez-faire and, um, and trustworthy. Um, and then make sure you're traveling safely and you're going to stay in a, in, in a good, safe location. So I hope help, that helps provide some clarity. But um, I hope one day to go to the Philippines. I've never been there. I've been to China and other places. Um, I have a lot of friends and colleagues from the Philippines. So I've heard great things. And just looking into the cities who are here on this um, presentation and the images you've shared, it, it, it looks like um, you're, you're in very beautiful, uh, nice uh, communities. So congratulations to the su success you've had so far. 
Thank you, Mr. Mitnick. Uh, to our three mayors, there, uh, there was a suggestion or a mention made by Councillor Mendoza about uh, monitoring uh, uh, the, the incoming uh, tourists and, and monitoring them while they're in your jurisdiction. Uh, let me ask you a pointed question. Uh, Chinese visitors uh, accounts for 22% of our uh, arrivals, while Korea accounts for 24% of our arrivals. Uh, uh, previews, uh, meaning uh, the early days of the COVID, there were some uh, discriminations uh, made about Chinese uh, visitors uh, and the new ones between Chinese, Taiwanese, uh, Korean, Japanese seems to be lost in the transi transition. Um, may I know uh, to, to our three local chief executives, to what extent uh, uh, would uh, such behavior be uh, mitigated in your uh, area as uh, soon as uh, foreign travelers are allowed to enter? And then second, uh, the second question is really how do you restore uh, confidence among domestic travelers? Mayor Rosal? Mayor Rosal? Uh, okay, Councillor Mendoza, would you want to take the, to respond to the question? Yes, uh, the first is uh, uh, here in Puerto Princesa, our number one tourist arrivals are Koreans and Chinese. Yes, yes. Uh, Good morning again. Yes. Uh, uh, Mayor Rosal, see si Councillor Mendoza muna. And then isusunod kita. Okay? Thank you, Mayor Rosal. Councillor Mendoza, please. Yes, uh, again, uh, our number one tourist okay, arrivals okay. here are Koreans and Chinese. Yes, we have problems uh, or difficulties dealing with uh, our new uh, tourists like the Koreans and Chinese because of the cultural difference and uh, language barriers. No? Uh, what we did is we trained or we, we imported or requested uh, translators because, uh, because of the language barrier, it's hard to communicate with them on laws and things that they have to observe while they're here in Puerto Princesa. So while we are training our local tourist guides to study or to learn their dialect or language, we, we requested for trans, um, translators or to, so that we can communicate with them. And of course, uh, teach them how uh, things are done here or how to observe uh, our laws and policies regarding tourists. Thank you, Councillor Mendoza. Mayor Rosal? Hello? Am I, am I reaching you? Yes, sir. Am I Loud reaching and you? Clear. Loud and clear, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, uh, you know, when you say monitoring, it's about a system. You know? So we've uh, made that as early as uh, before we open up last June. Mayor, uh, Mayor Rosal is again off. May we have Mayor Yap? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Here in the province of Bohol, when you mentioned discrimination, I believe it was not the race that was being discriminated. It was the virus itself. Even here, whenever we have, uh, when people hear about the LSIs coming here and, uh, and they feel that it, they are from the provinces that has a lot of positive cases, they also try to uh, not really discriminate, but stay away from. So uh, we do not have any problems with discrimination for the, uh, when it comes to race, because Boholanos are really hospitable here, and we, have, we are really known because of our Boholano hospitality. And when it comes to monitoring, uh, it is really also uh, easy for us here, especially that we are only one island and we are not connected to any other provinces. Bohol is just one, uh, Bohol is just uh, a province 
in itself. So we won't have any problems in case if someone will be positive here with, when it comes to contact tracing. We are really prepared because of the new normal that, will be, that we will be doing anytime soon. So uh, discrimination and monitoring, we will not have any problems here, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor Yap. Uh, Mayor Rosal, are you back? If not, I will read uh, another question from our audience. Uh, this is a question to the foreign speakers. Based on what you've heard so far today from our Philippine speakers, which lessons from your experience with COVID-19 and tourism in the U.S. would be most applicable or useful in the Philippine context? Uh, Mr. Joseph? Which lessons? Um, wow. Um, that's one of those questions that I'd like to think about uh, first before just... Um, so, so, so what lessons... Could you repeat yes. that? Uh, okay. Um, which, uh, let me, uh, based on what you've heard so far today from our Philippine speakers, which lessons from your experience in COVID-19 and tourism in the U.S. would be the most applicable or useful in the Philippine context? You know, um, hearing, hearing what the mayors are doing in their communities, I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually very impressed by, by the by the steps that have been taken by the and and the outreach i mean i i was when i was listening about citywide caring for example this is this is stuff that um i'm i'm still trying to find stuff happening here in the us so um i think you know again i i i need to think about it but but very quickly off the cuff i i'm very impressed by what's happening and what the mayors are doing and what their communities are doing and I have nothing. I have nothing to add at this time. Mr. Mitnick. Um, thank you. That's a great, great question, and I commented on some of that earlier. So I, I would say lessons. One thing I forgot to talk about was the importance of public communication during a crisis, and I'm proud that our city led the way in our region, and the South Bay region. And I say that with, um, I'm stressing the pride because when I was the county administrator in Sutter County, which is the first county north of Sacramento County up um, in Northern California, when we were dealing with the, the, um, the near, we had to evacuate the entire county when it looked like uh, the Oroville Dam, if you're, that's one of the major dams in, um, in California, it, it looked like that was going to completely fail. And that those of us that were down, we had an eight hour period to evacuate the county. It was a crisis, not just because of that emergency incident, but we did not do a good job communicating with the public, even though we have all this technology, right? Social media, Nixel. Here in our city in El Segundo and other South Bay cities, we've done a very good job getting the word out to our residents and businesses. In fact, just today I was having coffee with a private sector executive and a lady came up to me and asked if I was the city manager and I said, yes. And she said, I want to tell you, your city has done a great job keeping us informed. So public communication, whatever tools you use, that's key. Your residents and your businesses have to know what's going on. You have to share information with them because otherwise they'll panic. And I really don't know how it works in the Philippines. And maybe you do a way better job than we do. But I will tell you, we've done a, a good job here, the, the use of technology. Another, so a good lesson going forward, your city's public information office will play a greater role in your governance. You can't just say, oh, I have a person over there. They do press releases. They interact with the media. No, the elected officials, mayors, uh, here our mayor, we had our mayor uh, doing daily broadcasts, daily updates, what's going on. And if there was nothing going on, he would say there was nothing going on. So more, more attention will have to be committed, uh, committed to public communication and the use of social media. So I wanted to point that out. Also the future of land use, how we design our communities will be much different. And the private sector will lead the way to some extent in terms of office development and so on. Um, and um, how much we devote to uh, public health and, and the social services I think will be different. Personal hygiene, how we set up our workforce here in our city hall, we have all these um, uh, plexiglass devices uh, protecting employees from the public and employees from each other. Uh, 
And I, one last thing, the importance of interdependency. And um, can't just say, well, we have a pandemic, it's all China's fault, or it's some other country's fault, or maybe perhaps people in your neck of the, uh, in, in Asia are saying, it's all the United States' fault. They're not taking this seriously enough. We can't just blame somebody else. We have to look in the, the mirror and realize we're in it together and let's learn from each other and, and not have to be so, um, the need to, to, to fix blame. Um, so I, I would encourage those of us in the trenches of local government, let's work together, learn from each other, and let's talk about what doesn't work well, what our, our shortcomings are and how we can uh, grow from that. I hope that's helpful. Uh, those are some yeah, comments. That's, uh, that, that's very helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Mitnick. There are two other questions uh, uh, sent by our audience. Uh, one is for the three mayors. Uh, it's about virtual reality. Uh, virtual reality is defining the landscape of tourism. Has there been an initiative by your city to use such technology given quarantine measures to connect to the city visitors? As cities are looking forward to the resumption of leisure travel, how prepared are cities in terms of technology and connectivity? Mayor Yap? Uh, Ma'am, here in the province of Bohol, when it comes to connectivity, we have fiber to the home from PLDT. We have other networks as well who are uh, giving us the bandwidth. We have uh, call centers that are coming in. That's why the uh, public utilities, when it comes to the connection, are coming in, especially with the large bandwidth. So we don't have any problems with connectivity here with the technology. Uh, people are really improving their technologies, the businesses as well. So again, we won't have any problems even before COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Yap, uh, Mayor Yap, uh, Councilor Mendoza. Yes, uh, same here in Puerto Princesa. We 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 are we already up, the telecom companies have already updated our uh, communications here. We have already fiber optics from three companies, three telcos, and uh, in our tourism industry, the PPUR, the Puerto Princesa Underground River Management, is already. Uh, starting to operate their uh, online uh, online services like uh, on, online uh, bookings. Uh, the city tourism department is already on process with talking with a uh, company provider to, to, to work on our uh, contactless online services uh, in tickets, sales, and uh, our, regarding our tourism bookings. And our Thank, you. Thank you, Councillor Mendoza. Mayor Rosal, are you back? Or are we still missing you? Okay, Mayor Rosal is not here. Let's go to the question. Last two questions. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Uh, Ms. Nita Socrates, with the pandemic, most small travel and tour businesses are suffering. What is your city going to do? To what is your city doing to help these small businesses to stay put while waiting for the opening of the domestic and international travelers? Uh, and then uh, let me add this last question: When you uh, from Adli Junior Sarail, when you open borders to tourism in your respective localities, how would you assure travelers' safety? Mayor Ya. Yes, ma'am. With, uh, with regards to safety here in the province of Bohol, uh, as mentioned earlier, Bohol is really safe, especially we have a very low crime rate, especially here in Tagbilaran City, the only city in the province of Bohol. And uh, we will be able to let our tourists feel safe, especially with the precautionary measures, with the disinfections, uh, with the checks and everything, with the disinfectant, with the checkpoints. We are really tight here with the checkpoints. So uh, basically, especially with the low COVID cases here in, in, in the province of Bohol, our only cases here are uh, mostly LSIs. We only have three local transmissions here. So we really feel that we will be able to advertise or market the province of Bohol as a safe tourist destination in the near future. Okay, uh, sir, regarding the small uh, businesses, uh, uh, what are your contingency plans? Uh, uh, so that uh, while they're waiting for the opening of the domestic and international travelers, uh, they can be assisted. With regards to the small businesses here, 
we will be able to help them with the discount of the business permits. We'll be able also to help them with regards to help them market, especially with our radio programs, with the social media. So we will be able to also help them market their uh, respective businesses. So we'll just be working hand in hand, the private sector and the city government of Tagbilaran. Thank you. Councillor Mendoza? Yes, ma'am. Uh, same question uh, regarding how can you assure travelers uh, of their safety uh, once uh, domestic tourism is now allowed? And, and second is uh, what will you do with the small businesses while waiting for the opening of the domestic and international travel? Yes. Um, here in the Puerto Princesa International Airport, uh, there is a, we already have a facility to test, to monitor uh, incoming tourists when when they come in. Um, right now, we, we don't have regular flights yet, but we do accept LSIs and the returning residents here. But uh, we have quarantine facilities, uh, big hotels that uh, the city rented out for to quarantine, uh, positive or suspects for COVID-19 patients. And for the small enterprises, uh, we have an ordinance here that uh, that uh, protects our small businesses to prior prioritize them, especially when there's mice events here. And uh, for now, like I mentioned earlier, our support for the, like for our boat months or the, the tourist boats that has been displaced because of the COVID-19, uh, we allow them, they have been allowed to use their boats for fishing to you know, uh, have extra income. And for the urban transports, we are working with the banks to, to waive or to stop the interest until uh, the end of July so that they they, they can they can have they can uh, have some extra um, income and uh, not worry about their monthly amortization or mortgage. Thank you, Councillor Mendoza. Uh, let me now do something different from the first two. Uh, I will give uh, our panelists. Uh, their closing uh, remarks and, and probably key, key takeaways uh, before we end uh, this uh, sharing session. Let me start off with our foreign guest. Uh, Mr. Mitnick, would you like to do the, the closing, your closing? Just key takeaways. Okay. But again, a good city manager likes to go at the end. Um, okay. <laughs> Um, I think I covered a, a lot of it in, in, in my comments, um, and um, you know, the my main thing would be, all of us have been through crises in the past. We've been through emergencies. We're we're in the middle of another one, and for those of us in the United States, we're dealing with two crises at the same time. Not just the COVID nineteen, but the civil unrest, the protest, uh, um, um, some very serious diversity and racial. Uh, issues within our country. And as painful as it is, as uncertain as it is, and nowhere is it more telling. Uh, earlier that you were talking about the impact on small businesses. I imagine it's the same in your cities, but when you go into the local restaurant that's owned by um, the, uh, we call it the mom and pop restaurant, you know, the husband and wife, and they're really impacted. They're the ones I feel the most for. Big corporations have a way to work their way through this, at least most of them do. But we will get through it, so just keep that in mind. We'll get through it, we'll come out smarter, better, faster. We'll be more innovative, more creative. We've cured all kinds of diseases as human beings. We'll figure this one out. It's very painful um, along the way. Remember, everything has a beginning, middle, and end. And we're in the middle section, and, and it's very, there's a lot of uncertainty with that. So I like to end on a more upbeat uh, note and say that the glass is half full. We're smart people, we'll figure it out, we'll work with the private sector, and we just have to hang in there and take it one day at a time and not let the totality of what we're facing overwhelm us. So the, um, that those would be my non-technical answers. Uh, but the, the, the glass is half full and, the, and we'll get through it. That's what I would like to be on record as saying to conclude my comments, so thank you. 
Thank you, sir. Uh, Joseph. Thank you, ma'am. Hey, thanks, Scott. It's nice to nice to follow you on this one. Um, so yeah, so my takeaways essentially are, uh, you know, be patient, um, reach out and help, uh, be helpful, um, and 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 understand the relevance of your brand. So so people will remember what we did today when things are better. Like Scott, I also want to end on a uh, on a positive note. I'm very optimistic about what this will bring. I'm very very excited at the um, at some of the innovations that have already shown up. Um, and you know, and I just think that you know, as humans, uh, we're very resilient, and uh, we will get through this. It's just how we get through it. So so um, you know, so I think we just uh, take one day at a time. Be moderate. Um, don't overreact, as Scott says. And uh, and I think it'll all be fine. So um, yeah, uh, but, but the thing is, reach out, don't sit on the sidelines, be active, <laughs> and people will remember this when, when things are back to normal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Mendoza? Yes, um, for me, I know that uh, Tourism here in Puerto Princesa will definitely bounce back. But uh, during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we realized two things. Um, first, we have to improve on our health uh, sector. And number two, I'll be speaking about tourism. Um, we realized that uh, we, the city government of Puerto Princesa, the people of Puerto Princesa, the businessmen of Puerto Princesa all engage in tourism. Okay, we don't have any other industry here, but our major our major industry is tourism. So during our series of meetings with the mayor, we 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 thought about things that we have to do after this. Of course, tourism will bounce back. I guarantee that 100 percent. But we have to be smarter this time. Okay, we have to diversify. What? The mayor said, let us engage in agritourism. We have a lot to offer. We are all based, our tourism here is all based on nature-based tourism. Our CBSTs are, majority are all nature-based tourism. Now we have to explore another uh, part of our tourism site, which is the agri agritourism and the mariculture-based um, tourism. So we will be focusing on a new venture uh, regarding the agri-tourism here in Puerto Princesa. So let us all just work together and uh, we'll get through this. We will bounce back. We did before. We will do it again. Thank you so much, Councillor Mendoza and Mayor Yap. Ma'am, I would like to thank everybody for making this event successful and I believe that everybody deserves a virtual round of applause. I don't know how to do it, but uh, we all deserve a big virtual round of applause and I would like to thank the mayors for sharing their best practices. I will be able to follow some of them and uh, with this pandemic of ours it brought the best and the worst out of the leaders and we just have to pray to God Almighty that we will be able to overcome this pandemic and live on with a new normal and hopefully tourism will be back. We are confident here in the province of Bohol because of our beautiful uh, tourist destinations, we'll be able to bounce back, especially that we were hit the 7.2 magnitude earthquake last 2013, and we were able to bring back tourists here in the province. And uh, after this pandemic, we'll be able to bring back the tourists as well. So thank you once again. Thank you, Mayor Yap. Mayor Rosal, I think you're back. Yes, sorry, yeah, sorry. He is. Uh, yeah, please, just gonna... Uh, yeah, yeah, just wanna add, ma'am, just wanna add, ma'am, the system yeah, is already in place here in Legaspi. The majority of the people took up with the crisis. That's very too, uh, too important uh, thing that we have really to showcase in the city in order to bring back the uh, business again. And it's just a matter now of uh, sustainability, and of course, uh, following all the rules and regulation, I think Legaspi will be okay, especially for, for even foreign tourists and uh, our local tourists, which is our stronghold, being the regional center of Legal. Thank you very much.
Thank you so much, Mayor Rosal, and thank you for you know getting back. Uh, let me, on my part, just make two uh, statements. Uh, when you, will, you look at the entire tourism ecosystem uh, post-COVID, or probably as uh, most of the speakers are saying, in the middle of it, uh, we are looking at actually reopening and rebuilding destinations that will require joint approach. Uh, collaboration was mentioned, innovation, adaptability, uh, those are key words. Communication was uh, frequently uh, mentioned. Uh, there was internal, external, and how you relate with the stakeholders are very important. One final note, the crisis in a, is an opportunity to rethink tourism of the future. Uh, we are a tourist destination, the country is, uh, and it is one of the major uh, economies uh, of our nation. Uh, we had three very beautiful places in the country, uh, Tagbilaran, Legaspi, and Puerto Princesa. I wish to revisit you in better days, and I hope that domestic tourism will be able to shore up our economy as we move on. Thank you very much, and on behalf of USAID, Surge, Publicus Asia, and APCA, Thank you so much to our guests, uh, Mayor uh, Rosal, Mayor Yap, Councillor Mendoza, Mr. Rob Joseph, and Mr. Scott Mitnick. Thank you so much for the learning.